There's an anonymity to American society that we must uncover. You see, we must reveal the face of the evil genius in order to reprogram the enigmatic system that normalizes complacency by the people, the media, and the world. What does he, I underline he, look like? What am I talking about? I'm talking about the application of responsibility. I'm calling out those that don't recognize the machinery, those that continue to fuel the gears of injustice by seeing my problem as my problem, opposed to seeing my problem as our obligation, problems as our problems, and how the world passively turns a blind eye to what they feel doesn't directly affect them. I can't make you care about black people, but if I try hard enough, I could make you realize that we are all black, at least to some degree. Because history reveals fallacy as the truth radiates the cancer in the organism, the machine. You can't fix it if you don't see its operation and you won't know something is wrong if the guard is telling you, don't worry, they are just starting trouble. All lives matter. There's no problem with the system. Blacks and Latinos just have a higher propensity to commit crime. We are not targeting them, they are targeting us. This is the rhetoric and the media is equally at fault from news coverage to television shows like First 48 that seemingly only have behind the scene access to people of color committing murders. Again, when you are indoctrinated with only one side of the story, it becomes more and more difficult to unravel the anonymity of American society, the machine. Now, why is it that when people see the posters for my American Negro campaign that state, Abraham Lincoln did not care about black people, I'm suddenly fueling hate speech? I've received messages about this. Think about this and why someone would be offended by this accusation. It's because we are indoctrinated from birth with rhetoric in order to make us feel like America has no race problems. And if you deny it, you are a troublemaker. You are perpetuating division or divisiveness at a time when we are the most divided, seriously? We are taught that Abraham Lincoln was honest Abe But when Lincoln was accused by a political rival of being a black Republican or someone that stood for Negro equality, he responded, I am not, nor ever have I been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. There is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. You see, if you don't know the facts, you can't reasonably contextualize how and why racism still exists. Race is a social construct and was insidiously pioneered to qualify the institution of a slaveocracy. Again, there is an anonymity to American society that we must uncover or reveal so that both sides clearly understand what's going on. But this unearthing needs strength. It needs power. It requires a continuous flow of new people and ideas, passionate about posterity and justice for all. And my next guest is one of those people. She's an academic and civic leader a co-founder of the Los Angeles chapter of Black Lives Matter, a mother of three, a womanist scholar, activist, and tenured professor that puts her life on the line for all of us, a beautiful person, a human being that I have the utmost admiration and respect for. Please welcome a true American hero, Dr. Melina Abdullah. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. You're okay. <laughs> it's an honor to speak with you because your life is dedicated to your missions, your passion, you know? And I just want to jump in and just build with you. We don't even have enough time because I could have a 24 hour discussion with you. But first of all, I want to ask you know, I've noticed that the more active approach people take in contextualizing and refuting revision history, revisionist history, the more they are attacked by those that are intransigent against the views they passionately find un-American. 
Why is it that when we explain truths, we get hated on? Talk to me about this. What do you think about well, that? Well, I, I really loved your opening, right? And okay. you're absolutely right. Abraham yeah. Lincoln didn't care about Black people. He said it, right? He yeah. said, you know, I am here to preserve the union. If I could do so without freeing one slave, I would, but I can't, so I won't. I'm paraphrasing, yes. right? Yes, um, yes, yes. But, but you're right. The issue is you're telling the truth, but for our entire lives, we've been fed lies, right? We've been told that, you know, Columbus discovered America and Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, right? Um, and it's really difficult to kind of um, challenge that both socialization and miseducation. But that's the work that we have to do both in our organizing work, both in our uh, media work and through our formal educational work. So this is why I teach Pan-African Studies to make sure that we teach truth, that we center different ways of knowing and that we do work that's um, intellectual building for the benefit of our people. It's a long struggle. You also raised, you know, this constant propaganda, right? That, you know, it's not just what is it, the first 48? I don't watch very much TV, yeah, but I, yeah, yeah, first I think it was 48. the first 48 that you mentioned. Yeah. But beyond that, like, why do we have to have a CSI for every city, right? Why is there, you know, why are there so many cop shows and of every angle, right? From, you know, I enjoyed watching Ride Along. I thought it was funny as hell. I don't know if you cuss on this show, but um, <laughs> okay. I thought it was really, I, I enjoyed it, right? And it was propaganda, right? Um, we have to remember that we're constantly socialized to believe that police, even the most rogue cops, bring us safety, right? The truth is, as we begin to challenge it and dismantle that problematic kind of frame, the truth is that communities have always been the ones to bring us safety. I will say that I have yet to meet a Black person on the face of this earth who has felt safer because a police cruiser pulled up behind them in traffic, right? Mm. Um, and so it's really important that we understand that there's a truth that challenges the misinformation, the propaganda, the propaganda that's been fed to us, but it doesn't cut through as easily because through every mechanism possible, the state and the police state in, in particular are feeding us these lies about what policing is, about who we are as Black people, about the presence or um, absence. They argue that that white supremacy only exists when people call you the N-word, that white supremacy is not at play in um, shutting Black folks out of mainstream media, that, that white supremacy is not at play when you talk about how our children are miseducated and criminalized, even in our schools. They try to act like it's Black folks' fault that we are contracting COVID-19 and dying of the disease um, at a rate that's two to three times our population share, when it's really um, the fault of a healthcare system that is not worthy of our trust, right? And so it's really important that we think about those things, but this I think speaks to the question that you raised, why it's so difficult, why people become so up in arms when we say, hey, you know what? Lincoln didn't do this because he likes black people. He did it as a political calculation. Absolutely. It's interesting going into this concept of propaganda. I love hearing you talk because of the detail, the vernacular, the perspectives you provide with words. I love, I love the energy. And you know, the concept of police officers is as American as our Declaration of Independence, a declaration that was created to protect white male landowners and their interest against everyone. That's one of the reasons I talked about he at the beginning. You know, uh, if we look in our history books, we'll find that the first time, first full time publicly funded police force was created in 1838 Boston, but it, it started much earlier than this in the South. Can you talk to me about the true evolution of America's police force and its objectives and how these objectives still haunt communities of color today? 
So this is something that's also very difficult for people to understand and to get right with. But I will say that there is unrefuted, or unrefuted history, um, irrefutable history for police in this country. Police, and this is not, you know, to be um, uh, inflammatory, but this is the truth. Even white criminal justice um, uh, scholars will admit this. Police in this country evolved from slave catching. Point blank period, it's irrefutable, right? And so where they come from, if you trace them back, is they come from patty rollers. So when um, white landowners, when white folks who dare to call us their property, their chattel, right? When we dare to take our own freedom, they enlisted the support um, paid people that they called patty rollers, slave patrols, to go out and find and hunt us and return us, return our foremothers and forefathers to ownership, right? That, to, to make us uh, slaves again, right? And I, I never use that word because I don't believe we ever were slaves. We were enslaved. Enslaved. But we were never slaves. We were always fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine. And so we were not slaves. We were enslaved. And that's what compelled our foremothers and forefathers to take our freedom. Because if we really understand God, um, whether you be a Christian or a Muslim or practice, you know, traditional African religions, it's actually sinful to submit to a master other than God. And so God compelled our foremothers and forefathers to take their freedom, right? And if you read about abolitionists of the day, if you read, you know, what Mama Harriet Tubman had to say for herself, what Nat Turner had to say for himself, what David Walker had to say for himself, what Frederick Douglass had to say for himself, they were completely, Henry Highland Garnett, right? Um, I think about his words, right? They believed and understood that the work that they were doing was by divine order, right? The work that they were doing to take their own freedom and the freedom of other African people was sacred work that God compelled them to do. And so as our people went to take our own freedom, we saw those who would dare to sin against God and say, no, God is not your master, I am your master, pay slave patrols, pay paddy rollers to go out and hunt us, find us, and return us to this condition of chattel, to this condition of property. That is the legacy of policing in this country. That's where it comes from, the target on the backs of black people is not coincidental, it's not accidental, it is deliberate and intentional based on that history of policing. So from that perspective, you're telling me that the origins, the ideology of public funded police in America is the surveilling of Black people, right? The surveilling, dehumanization, and ownership of mm -hmm. Black people, the brutalization and theft of life of black right. people by a white capitalist state. Yes, so it's it's interesting because when we go from slave codes to black codes, uh, you will see that this duty to protect white landowners with their, let's just say chattel for the purposes of this discussion, the duty was a community duty. If you did something <laughs> that would not allow the slave codes to, or, or that would just abridge the catching of a slave, you can be fined. You can be uh, punished for getting in the way of bringing the enslaved back to their enslavers. And it's just an interesting conundrum here because people look at the police as if it's something that is as natural as humans just being humans. But when people like Black, well, when, when coalitions like Black, Fund, Black Lives Matter, you know, when different activists, different academics talk about defunding the police, it's difficult 
for the average person that doesn't really understand history to perceive a community without a police force. So, like, how would you explain to them that, well, let me back up for a second. Can you give a give a better expl- explanation than what I'm giving to defund the police? Like, talk about that. Um, defund the police is actually exactly what it sounds like. We want to take money away from police and put it into the things that actually create safe communities. So it's not difficult. It's not complicated. Right. We know that in major cities like Los Angeles, we're spending upwards of 53% of our city's general fund on police, when the challenges that we see in our communities are things like housing and healthcare and mental health resources and educational programs and arts programs, that's what we need money for. We don't need money for police. Police kill our people, police brutalize our people, police surveil and traumatize our communities. And so we're saying defund the police because, um, you know, Barack Obama called it snappy slogan. And I was saying, no, it's not a snappy slogan, but I actually disagree with myself. It's pretty snappy, right? (laughs) Um, But it's not just a snappy slogan. Of course, of course. It's a policy demand. It's a policy demand. And that's what we mean when we say defund the police. We mean that literally. Right. So something that's very interesting about you is your passion for righteousness and seeing you on the front lines. Um, what does it take to be an activist? What is that move? Like, what does it take? So for me, um, now I'm telling you my whole life story, but for me, Mm -hmm. um, You know, I've always had a degree of consciousness. I was born in the 70s in Oakland, California. You can't be from Oakland in the 70s and not have a degree of consciousness, right? And so I'm grateful for the time and place in which I was born. I'm grateful to be of the Panther Cub generation, hip hop generation, um, and how that kind of breathed consciousness into me. That said, you know, there's kind of a rebelliousness that comes with that time and place. It wasn't until the birth of Black Lives Matter, and I was one of the original members who convened to form Black Lives Matter. I had been in community in Los Angeles, moved moved here in my 20s, and had been, been in a community of Black organizers. But what happened with Black Lives Matter was kind of this. Um, visceral response to the theft of the life of Trayvon Martin and the state condoning it by backing George Zimmerman. So Black Lives Matter was birthed the moment that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. I've always been an activist, right? I've always been taught to fight oppression, to stand up for what I believe in, to join with others, right? That was part of what was breathed into me. But I think there's a difference. That's activism. Activism is not being quiet, is refusing to just submit to the way in which the state assails us. But I became an organizer through Black Lives Matter, which means that I'm still an activist. But I also know that when I talk about Um, When we talk about creating systemic level change and toppling institutions that are meant for our oppression, it's not just about pushing back, it's about visioning forward. And so for me to be an activist and then to evolve into an organizer, I was able to step into that because I believe it to be my sacred duty. Um, People talk about callings and I have a very strong connection to my spirit, to the divine, and to my people. And I felt called into the work. And so I think to be an activist and to be an organizer, right, which is a deeper commitment, we have to also be connected to each other because you can't organize by yourself, right? Um, And have to be connected to spirit and to the divine 
and move in a way that is really, again, when we think about Mama Harriet Tubman, not that I'm any Harriet Tubman, but I learned lessons. I learned lessons from her, right? That we have to be unapologetic about the way in which spirit pulls us towards justice and to do righteous work. It's as if it's therapeutic for you in a way, you know, like when I watch your, when I watch you in videos, when I, when I see you talk, as I am talking to you now, it's like, you're absolutely real. And if you can think about, just kind of think back to after the George Floyd murder, I, I call this the the largest civil rights movement in the world because of social media, right? Yeah, people around the world talking about injustice, and it was great to see all these faces doing it. And at the same time, I had some of my best, closest white friends sending me messages about, hey, are you okay? As if some of them didn't realize some of the things that was happening to us, you know? And then there were other people that were seemingly overly empathetic to what was going on. And there were some people where you questioned, you questioned their participation in the movement. So I ask this question, how should white people participate in social activism? You know, there are um, a lot of closed door conversations. Now I'm telling on this, right? A lot of closed door conversations that black people have about white people. And we need those. We need to have space to do that. And I'm going to say that for me, I might get myself in trouble. Standing behind those closed doors was an absolute necessity for me because I didn't, and I still don't, trust most white people. But this work, um, the way in which white folks, not just after George Floyd, but for the entire eight years of Black Lives Matter, the way in which some white people have shown up for us gives me renewed hope that we can get to a place beyond where we are, like that we can end white supremacy, that there are accomplices in this work that are willing to topple a system that they've been bred all of their lives to believe benefits them, right? So we always begin Black Lives Matter um, actions and meetings with the pouring of libation. And we always call on the names of our African ancestors. And I joke with one of my closest comrades and dearest friends, Dahlia Ferlito, who's co-founder of White People for Black Lives, that they have one ancestor they be called on, right? Uh, John Brown, right? So they'll have- John Brown. <laughs> They were hashtagging John Brown 2015. John Brown. John Brown 2015. John Brown. Okay. I think <laughs> that it, um, you know, for folks who don't know, we know that John Brown sacrificed yes. his life and the lives of his sons at the raid on Harper's Ferry, that mm -hmm. he was willing to give everything in order yeah. to topple chattel slavery. And yes. You know, there aren't many examples of white men who'd be willing to do that. In fact, that's why we keep talking about John Brown, because that's about it, right? Yeah, yeah. But I do feel like that through this movement, there is a small and tight contingent of white folks who are willing to summon the spirit of John Brown. And um, what that means for us is again, working to topple a system that they've been trained to believe benefits them and doing so with some level of sacrifice, right? So I think about one sister I work with named Gina and how um, I was arrested a couple years ago outside of, um, at, within police commission meeting, and it was a terrible arrest. And, you know, Gina just kept, who's also a mom, just kept putting herself in front of me. I was accused of 
battering a police officer, which just means unwanted touching, right? So he says, I grabbed his arm, which I did not. I'm off mm. now, so I can talk about the case, right? Mm. But Gina was like, she didn't grab your arm. I grabbed your arm, right? And mm. kept saying, take me, right? I think about people like Gina. I mm. think about the way in which people like Gina and this you know, group of white moms, um, when Eric Garcetti, who's the mayor of Los Angeles, his wife did this interview and said, like, really kind of almost proudly that she called the police on Black Lives Matter protesters 80 times over the course of the last year during the George Floyd uprisings. Wow. 80 times. And so we were like, you know, that's ridiculous. And she said, well, it was because we've been outside their house and it disrupts her daughter's study time, right? And so we had this group of white moms who went outside of um, the house and it was on Valentine's Day and rang the doorbell, confronted her and had all the black moms sit across the street, gave us champagne and chocolate and, you know, all like these Valentine's Day treats. But we're saying, you know, we're going to take the heat. We're going to confront um, this woman, Amy Wakeland. They, we have a hashtag, don't be an Amy, right? So I'm mm. saying all that to say that there is an essential role for white folks in this struggle. They have to be willing to kill their ego, to follow the leads of black organizers. They have to be willing to topple a system that they think benefits them or had been trained to believe benefits them. They have to use their voices. And that means like even in their own social circles, right? Be willing to talk at your Mother's Day brunch to the other white moms about why you don't want to be an Amy, right? Um, even though it makes that space uncomfortable. They have to use their bodies the way Gina did and say, you know, don't arrest her, arrest me. Even though it didn't work, she tried, right? Um, and you have to show up. And then finally, we need their resources, right? We need white money to help create a sustainable movement. And so we still want white folks of means and white folks that don't have means. If you don't have means, give up your Starbucks and donate it to Black Lives Matter. If you do have means, write a fat check, right? And so we need them to be involved because white supremacy is their doing. So it's their responsibility to dive in to dismantle it. But when you say white supremacy is their doing, are you saying that there's a nexus between what white people are doing right now and what white people did centuries ago? Or are you saying that they are continuing to maintain the machinations that were put in place back then, whether they know it or not, so therefore they are a conduit to the past? Like, I know those are kind of the same thing, but but a little different. Like, what are you really saying when you are bringing white imperialism, white supremacy into those white people of today with their actions? I'll say both and. They are responsible for their history, right? And mm -hmm. so I want us to think about it in terms of reparations, right? Okay. That white folks stole the labor yeah. and resources of black folks, right? Yes. Just because that happened, it wasn't you that did it. It was your great, 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 great grandfather that did it, right? White people. Let's put it in, in terms that we can visualize. We had uh, a trunk full of gold. Your great, 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 great grandfather stole that trunk full of gold, right? They're the thief, absolutely. And they beat us brutally. And some of us died so they could get that trunk full of gold. You're right, you didn't do that. But guess what happened when your great, 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 great grandfather died? They passed along that trunk full of gold. And now your great, great, great grandfather got it, right? And they built upon it. And then they passed it on to your great, great grandfather. They still got my great, 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 great grandfather and mother's gold, right? And then they passed it on to your great grandfather. Then they passed it on to your grandfather and your father. And now you, you have my gold, right? So history is ever present. 
you still owe me my gold. I still want my trunk of gold back. Give me that gold. So you are not absolved from the crimes of your forebears, right? Until you make it right. That's what reparations means. The root of that term is repair. Repair the damage that was done, right? So how do you how do you make it right as a white person? So I, I look so I, of course I understand every single thing that you're saying. I totally get it. And I have some of my closest friends are white. Some of my closest friends, and they're. You sound like that. like I got some that? of my closest friends are black. People. Are black? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My 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 daughter's halfway. Yeah, no, no. But I I say this all to say because when I'm talking to them about these issues, right? I don't look at them as the other white people that maintain white imperialism. I look at them as the people that fight for me and a lot of times even more than some of my black brothers and sisters, right? So the issue is what kind of culpability should they feel when they are advocating for us to be equal? You know what I'm saying? And like that's, I think that is something where, like for example, I know you've dealt with this many times where, you know, I'm sorry, are can I call you black or oh, I'm sorry, can I call you African American? Is it mm -hmm. Negro? Is it colored? Like, like mm -hmm. there there is this respect. Oh, like African and, Americans, right? So they feel yes. like they call you black, it's disrespectful, but so they'll go, my African American. No, right, right. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So so I, you know, I, I say this all to say. Of course, I, I understand everything that you're saying, right? But then there are those white people that are there for you more than some of your brothers and sisters, and you applaud them for being that, you know? And like, how should they feel? Or let me, like, how should they feel? And do they have a different duty because of their position and because of their heritage um, of this country? Yes, they have a duty. Um, how should they feel? I don't know how they should feel. I really don't care how they feel. Um, I don't care how it, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, my generation. So yeah. you know, I'm not that into feelings, right? I care what you do, right? Yeah. I care what you do. So you might feel like, well, I'm not racist. Well, all white people, this is going to be controversial, but it's true. All white people, regardless of how you feel, benefit from white supremacy, every single one of you. And it becomes your work to engage actively in anti-racism, right? It becomes mm. your work mm. Mm. to actively undo the system, not just to say, you know, I have black friends, but what are you doing to make sure that, you know, we and our children mm -hmm. get to walk down the street freely, right? What are you doing? And so we need them to take our survival as seriously as we do, right? There's no day you have children. There's no day that we are not anxious about right. our children, right? There's no day that we get to just live. And white people do. And, you know, the good white folks and the ones who are actively in, um, in, invested in white supremacy. So we need them to actively and consciously engage. And what we don't need, and this is what I think you're getting to, is we're not asking white people to feel guilty. So this is the feelings question. I don't need you to feel guilty because your feelings don't benefit the movement. I need you to do something, organize and stand with us to actively undo the system that gives you unearned privileges and puts my life and the lives of our people at risk. Because they received a benefit, a benefit that is based on our ancestors, and they are still receiving this benefit, therefore they should be culpable. And because of that, they must actively participate in unraveling the inequity. Absolutely. And that's got it. So how do you apply that concept to womanism? 
Um, okay, so womanism, I don't know if everybody understands womanism, but Alice Walker talks about how womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. So by engaging, and I define myself as a womanist. Oh, I define myself as a womanist. I looked at my fingernails, the purple piece, right? <laughs> uh, I define myself as a womanist because um, I have to constantly exist as my whole self, right? So I am black and a woman and a Muslim and a mother and someone from a working class background all at the same time. And so I can't free just a piece of me. So if I only work on um, black freedom as black men's freedom, then I'm not free. If I only work um, as a feminist, right, who um, commits themselves to the liberation of women, but doesn't talk about specifically and put at the center black women, then I'm not free. And so womanism means that we all engage in the constant struggle, not just for black freedom, but for freedom. Those are Angela Davis's words, right? That freedom is a constant struggle. Freedom is a constant struggle. And so that requires um, the fight and the commitment of black women, uh, indigenous women, other women of color. And it requires the fight of the men who we stand alongside, the gender non-conforming people that are part of our communities. Um, and, you know, the, the white folks, right, have to begin to, not begin, they have to commit to reframing feminism away from this white supremacist um, notion and towards a womanist frame that says that until black women, until women of color are free, women are not free. It's interesting because a lot of people don't realize that in the suffrage mu movements, marches that we had back in the day, you know, black women weren't allowed to be in the front lines. They were in the back of those marches. You know, when I when Ida B. Wells became famous for searching for why all these black people were being lynched, a lot of the white feminists at the time didn't really, they just pretty much avoided the subject, you know? Can I just pause you real Go quick? Go for it. Go for I, it, yes. Just real quick. And who did stand up and fund Ida B. Wells' beautiful, brilliant, courageous work was other Black women. Um, black women of means, like the club women, right? Mm -hmm. Made sure that Ida B. Wells was protected, made sure that her movement was funded. And when we talk about Black women of means, they didn't have means like white women had, right? They had mm -hmm. means like... They were able to pay for their meals and, you know, have homes, right? Mm -hmm, so they mm -hmm. pooled their money and their resources because I think a lot of times people forget that Black people have been funding and supporting our own movements from the beginning, right? We can think right. about the role of the AME church, where the thought yes. of mutual aid even came from, right? Mm -hmm. It came from Black people being willing um, and seeing ourselves as a collective, we move uh, with this concept of linked fate more than any other group. Mm. So as you're talking about, you know, how white feminist movements refused to incorporate, include, and support Black women's organizing, we have to remember the courageous and beautiful and brilliant work of women like Lugenia Burns Hope and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and so many others, black club women, black sororities, which are sometimes minimized and trivialized and thought of in the same vein that they think of white sororities. Black sororities were never founded to be social organizations. They are service organizations that pool the resources of middle-class black women for the purposes of black freedom. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it was difficult back in the day for black women to have or be recognized or really have an identity inside or outside of slavery as a result of, of, of patriarchy and, and racism. And, they were considered property in a way that black men were not as they were exoticized and deemed incubators for generational wealth, right? Right. And 
this didn't happen to white women, but the perception carries a prestige that is ingrained in the patina of the American psyche today. You know, like, there is an intersectionality, there's a double consciousness that Black women still deal with today. So I love this concept of womanism because it, 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 it has a focus on intersectionality that feminism doesn't. And kind of moving on to another subject, I want to ask you a, a question that may seem kind of vague. Why do we say their names if we are all going to die anyway? Wow. I've never been asked that question in that way. So I'm going to answer um, from a space of spirit. Okay, go for it. It is an African tradition and practice that when we say the names of those whose bodies are no longer with us, that we are summoning them into space. Mm. And so that we, the work that we do in the name of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey, but also those who were killed here in Los Angeles and in California, people like Oscar Grant and Ezel Ford and Riddell Jones and Keisha Michael and Mark Quentin Sandlin, when we say their names, it's summoning them into the space. Because you mentioned this notion of righteous work, right? Work that's done just from a space of concept is not grounded in righteousness. Now, you can seek to move righteously, but there is nothing that you're tethered to, right? And so the reason that we say their name is because we want to do work in their honor. So, you know, you hear people sometimes talking about justice for, right? Justice for Trayvon Martin. We can't really get justice for him. Justice for him would mean that this 17-year-old child would have been allowed to walk to the store and come back and watch the basketball game with his father and brother and been a child, right? That would be justice for him. But we can get justice in his name. So I'm going to call Trayvon's name because I need his spiritual energy to make sure that the struggle for justice that I'm engaged in in his name is a righteous one. So we say their names for those reasons. We also say their names and we um, have something called more than a hashtag, more than a hashtag LA.com has some of the stories of those who've been killed by police. I'm sorry, more than a hashtag LA.org has some of the stories of those who've been killed by police, we want people to remember that we use the hashtag and we constantly engage with the families to ask them if they feel, I remember at a certain point, I felt like, am I disrespecting your loved one by putting a hashtag in front of their name? Mm. And I was speaking with the family of Waukesha Wilson, who I'm very close with, and her mom and auntie were like, no, we want you to put the hashtag there because It's shorthand, right? People know exactly what it is when you hashtag a name. We don't have to explain. It's clear. People have now been conditioned to understand that when you hashtag a name, it means that person was killed by police or by the state. And so they Mm -hmm. want that. But when we say more than a hashtag, we also want you to understand that Waukesha Wilson was a loving mother of a child, Jamel right, who is now graduating from high school without his mom. We want you to know that Waukesha Wilson is one who, when her friend didn't have a place to live and Waukesha was still struggling financially, she said, I can't give you money, but you can come live here, right? We want you to understand that the reason they call uh, Waukesha Wilson Wubo is because she was a beautiful little plump brown child and they used to laugh at her because she would constantly topple over and they would, her family would say, weeble wobble, but she don't fall down, right? So <laughs> yeah. we, want to, we say her name so that you can see her for her full humanity, not just the hashtag. You know, it's interesting. 
listening to your explanation, right? Because life isn't about dying. It's about living your life. So saying their names edifies their unique existence while at the same time recognizing the fact that they didn't get to enjoy life on earth like other people get to do, you know? That's and right. yeah, and, and, and go gave for me it. chills with that, right? It's also embracing them as living beings, knowing their life story, not just their death story. Yes. You know, so as I talk to you, as I see your passion, how do you find happiness in the struggle? Uh, because outside of an organizer, outside of an activist, outside of a professional academic, you are a mother and you give that energy to your family. How do you stay happy? You say you do cuss on here or you don't? You could cuss on here. Go for it. <laughs> do you know how fun it is to stand outside the L.A. Police Protective League? the police association that stole the life, the head of the police association, his name is Jamie McBride. His daughter, Tony McBride, just killed, a, it's been a year since she stole the life of Daniel Hernandez. And so it gives me not just joy, well, maybe I shouldn't say joy. Well, no, it is a sense of it's a reclamation of my power to stand mm. with Maria and Marina Vergara, the mother and sister of Daniel Hernandez, and say, fuck the police, right? Mm. It gives me great joy. It gives me joy to um, stand in front of the mayor's house and dare him to call the police on me again, right? Um, but it also the power that comes with this and the way that my children are reared up in this movement. My, I'm a single mom of three kids, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My children are being trained to not accept their oppression, right? So, you know, I remember my son who's now 11, but when Donald Trump was elected, we set a rule, right? My kids aren't allowed to cuss. Well, my oldest is now because she's 17. So I told them when they're 14, they can cuss, but they got to pretend, <laughs> like, pretend like that they don't cuss in front of me, but they can cuss, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> but okay. She's graduated from high school, so now she can full on cuss, right? Yeah, yeah. But my son, he couldn't cuss. So when Donald Trump was elected, I guess he was seven years old. But we set this rule. If you ever see Donald Trump in person, you can both give him the finger and say, fuck you, right? To Donald Trump. <laughs> but that's, that's just, like, that's the extent of it. That's when you can cut, right? Um, wow. and, and it's joyful, right? It's, it's joy to be able to talk about like these conditions. Yes, right? yes, yes, um, yes. You're building a movement that is joyful. Um, I get tremendous, you talked about, um, what did you call it? That it's, um, therapeutic, right? Mm -hmm. It's therapeutic, but it's also joyful. We built a movement mm -hmm. that, you know, Sunday we had this mass march and we took over this huge intersection in this white affluent space on 3rd and Fairfax. And when we got there, we turned up, this is America. And one of our members is a dance instructor. And we all like danced, 500 of us in the intersection, right? And, you know, gave the finger to the helicopters that were overhead. And mm. it's a joyful movement. It's a movement that, you know, we're abolitionists, so we're trying to upend unjust systems, but abolitionism is also about building the world that we envision, building the world of our most radical imaginings. And so that's joyful. To imagine a world, mm. like if you think about the world, like what does it sound like? I know you know about sound, right? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like, right? What does it smell like, right? Imagine a world that smells like, you know, jasmine and peach cobbler, right? That sounds mm. like music, right? That um, is filled with our 
children's laughter, right? Where, you know, we embrace each other with long hugs, not trying to hurry up and get to the next thing, right? Um, where we see, you know, all different, um, like by colors, I don't mean people, I mean vibrant colors, purples and blues and turquoises and art is everywhere, right? Where we can do all of that. And that's what we're building. And that is the definition of joy. So I bring that home to my children. Like, this is a joyful moment. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful and it's empowering. And my last question for you is that how can the people listening help become part of your movement? It's easy. Come out to stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Don't wait for a personal invitation. If you see something posted on Instagram, right? And it says, we're all meeting up on Saturday in Boyle Heights for the May Day March. Or we're all meeting up on Tuesday to check the sheriff. We're all meeting up on Wednesday to protest every single Wednesday in front of the LA Police Protective League. We need you to show up. We need you to organize with us, right? So for Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, you can go to blmla.org and sign up for our mailing list. You can follow our social media and come. It's really easy and it's really beautiful. It's really loving and show up with whatever you have. And so I know that you have a lot of folks who are into music. We need music in the movement, right? So if you come with a song, we want you to come and sing that song, perform that song, play that song, right? If you can cook, come and bring some fresh baked cookies that will inspire, that will bring us joy at the protest. And seriously, like we've seen people do this. We have this woman, had this woman at one of our protests who, um, as we were protesting, the district attorney actually worked for the district attorney. And she said, I can't come out and protest with you. But she had this huge box of pan dulce. And she mm. was like, here, I just want to give you something to stay, say, stay at it. And mm. if that's what you have to give. Bring whatever you have to give, your resources, your talents, your gifts, bring them to the movement and invest them in the movement. And it really is a joyful and fulfilling place to be. Well, you are honoring your commitment to our ancestors. And when I ask myself what freedom looks like for us, I look at people like you to provide the vision and scope of work necessary for us to achieve equality. You are a living legend. You are key in transforming the way the world is understanding cultural competency. Thank you for your continued service. And I hope to be on the front lines with you one day. Thank you for being on Invisible Blackness. Thank you so much for having me. I loved this conversation. My name is Melina Abdullah from Black Lives Matter, and you're listening to Invisible Blackness. Mm -hmm.